it's recording right now. Oh, okay. Um, welcome to the Moral Economy podcast number nine. nine. Second nine. season. Yeah. Second season number nine. Uh, I'm Chell, and I'll be I'll be your host today. I'm Nawaz, and I'm an unemployed back scrubber. I'm Andrew, and I'm an underwater basket weaver. <laughs> I am Frat. I am just another host. I am uh, Yasha, and I am a failed student. <laughs> Perfect. I am Ikram. I'm the special guest of tonight. <laughs> special guest. Yeah. Cool. So, um, yeah, so I have a little bit uh, something prepared, and uh, I want to talk about uh, a conflict or even perhaps contradiction internal uh, to uh, anarchist theory, uh, to put it very imprecisely. Uh, to start out with, it's the conflict between, you know, the anarchists, anarchists are committed to the idea that everybody can do whatever they want, but uh, there's also this uh, expectation that uh, people behave according to some kind of code, or at least that we don't subject ourselves to authoritarian structures of power, yeah? And it seems that there's a conflict here, because if we're allowed to do every, anything we want, why can't we subject ourselves to authoritarian structures of power, yeah? Uh, and in order to approach this topic, I want to look, look specifically at the relationship between anarchy and crime and punishment. Yeah, I think that's a good way in to this topic. So good. Um, how to begin? Uh, that's the, uh, all right. So I'd like to start with a quote. So this is from, uh, PAN. It's called, it's the Planetary Alternatives Network. They're a, a group of anarchists and they, they recently, or I'm not sure when, but they, they published, uh, they, they want to try to create an anarchist international. Uh, and this is sort of from their mission statement for this anarchist international. Yeah. And they say, uh, that, uh, and this is a quote, we value diversity in itself limited only by our common rejection of structures of domination, such as racism, sexism, fundamentalism, etc. cetera. Uh, and it continues because we value diversity, we do not expect uniformity of views other than, uh, the acceptance of the principles themselves. Uh, and the principles being, in this case, the principles of self-organization, voluntary association, and mutual aid. So here we see the beginning of this, this conflict, of this contradiction, yeah? Because on the one hand, they believe in diversity and inclusion, but on the other hand, they want people to conform to these principles, principles of self-organization, voluntary association, and mutual aid. So uh, how, can we, how can we work this out? Uh, and to answer that, or to begin to answer that, I would like to uh, turn to uh, the problem of crime in anarchist societies, yeah? So I want to start with two examples of crime. The first one is easy, and maybe even a little bit too easy, maybe even a little bit unfair for theorists of anarchy. And the second is more difficult. Uh, the aim, again, is to expose this underlying conflict in anarchist thought, yeah? So uh, my first example. Uh, there are grave crimes uh, that threaten the long-term stability of uh, society. Chief among these crimes, uh, in my mind at least, are re related to the destruction of the environment, and there are also crimes of exploitation, namely paying one's workforce so little that they cannot fully explore their potential as human beings. Uh, additionally, the manipulation of the game, such that wealth becomes concentrated in a small group of elites, while the rest of us face insecurity, desperation, and abuse. So uh, these are uh, the first example of crimes. Now, these crimes, which for the most part uh, are not even criminalized in our present society, are easily solved uh, in sort of classical anarchist theory. Anarchy locates power not in vast systems of government, but rather in the, uh, at the immediate community level. Concerning the environment, it's easy for owners to prioritize profit over sustainability because few of them need to live in the environments immediately affected by the pollution that they cause. Communities that are directly affected by pollution are much more likely to support environmentally friendly policies. Hence, if it were, if it were communities making the decisions, environmental destruction would be greatly reduced. Uh, this works uh, the same with questions of exploitation. If workers controlled their own pay, they would probably not choose to exploit themselves. Like, hey, let's just give all our money to that guy. You know, that sounds like a good thing to do. So probably that wouldn't happen, yeah? Uh, now, of course, there are questions of enforcement. How would you enforce something like this? But we'll leave them aside for now. And uh, let's look at the second example of crime, the more difficult example. So the second example is serial rapists. Uh, and, there are, and there are a couple of important differences between this example and the first example, and maybe also controversial, uh, controversial differences. The first difference is that crimes related to pollution and exploitation are preventable, whereas rape cannot be prevented in every instance. Uh, second difference, crimes related to pollution and exploitation threaten the long-term stabi uh, stability of society, whereas serial rapists do not. 
uh, serial rapists will only ever be a very a, a tiny fraction of a percent of the population. Uh, so, of course, the crime is terrible, uh, and we shouldn't underestimate the impact that rape has in society. But nevertheless, I don't believe that it has the potential to threaten the very existence of society. Yeah? So, uh, yeah, rape is a serious crime, and there's also good evidence that we live uh, currently in a culture of rape. Uh, steps, of course, can be taken, both in our present society as well as in an anarchist one, to address and change this culture. Uh, if this were successfully done, then there would be fewer rapes, but they would nevertheless still occur. There would still occasionally be rape. Yeah? Uh, given the severity of rape and the physical and psychological harm inflicted on the victim, uh, it is human to want to punish rapists, and serial rapists all the more so. So the question is, how do anarchists uh, punish rapists? Yeah? So. Uh, doing a little bit of research, I've heard everything from assertions uh, that uh, crime in anarchist society is completely reducible uh, to systems based on coercion, and therefore no crime can exist at all in anarchist society. And I've also uh, heard anarchists call for public execution of serial rapists. Yeah, so there's a whole spectrum of answers uh, on the internet that anarchists give uh, uh, regarding the problem of punishment. Yeah? So keep in mind that power is located uh, in communities, uh, in local communities at the community level. Hence, it follows that communities can choose their own methods of punishment, yeah? and potentially also their own methods of, of policing their, their communities and, and, and legal systems, all of this. Yeah? Uh, however, the question then is how can one prevent one community from adopting draconian punishment or draconian policing mechanisms? Yeah? So to reiterate, the conflict is everything is the conflict here in anarchy in the theory is that everything is allowed except with the emphasis on except. Yeah? And how do we ensure this except? Yeah? And uh, yeah, so I was thinking at this point that maybe I could hear if there are comments from, from the other hosts here. Uh, take a minute if you, anything pops into your mind. Uh, if not, I'll just continue. So anybody have something they would like to say? Okay, good. So you go ahead. Okay, good. So uh, perhaps I was a little bit unfair because uh, it's kind of a straw man uh, argument. And I think uh, uh, the reason is that um, the, the problem might very well lie in a more sort of classical view of anarchy as a sort of negative political theory. So this means that anarchy uh, traditionally doesn't say how things should be, but rather it's, it's a theory of freedom from things, freedom from oppression, freedom from immoral power structures, uh, freedom from arbitrary authority, you know? Uh, and that, uh, so this has sort of been our classic uh, conception of anarchy. And I think that, um, oh, well, to, uh, to, I have a quote from Emma Goldman, who's preeminent uh, philosopher, anarchist philosopher, and, uh, and I think it really uh, explains this negative uh, political vision of anarchy quite well. So she says, anarchism then really stands for the liberation of the human mind from the domination of religion, the liberation of the human body from the domination of property, liberation from the shackles and, res uh, and restraint of government. Uh, anarchism stands for a social order based on the free grouping of individuals for the purposes of producing real social wealth an order that will guarantee every human being free access to the earth and full enjoyment of the necessities of life according to individual desires, tastes, and incl inclinations. So she's really saying it's freedom from all of these oppressive uh, aspects of life, uh, oppressive religion, uh, oppressive property, oppressive government, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Although you see the problem again, you see the contradiction uh, immediately, because she says uh, the full enjoyment uh, of the necessities of life according to individual desires, tastes, and inclinations. But of course, those individual desires and tastes and inclinations can't include inclinations for religion or property or government, right? I mean, that's what we're free from, you know? So you can do anything you want, but not those things, yeah? But you can do anything you want, but not those things, right? So there's the, the, difficult, the difficulty, yeah? Um, yeah, I'm seeing a couple uh, hands up. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we can do some comments here uh, on this then, so. I think, I think you, point out the, you point out the contradiction quite well, but what I'm trying to grasp around over here is that, again, you know, this, this contradiction is, again, coming out in this sort of... Um, there's sort of an explanation of that, you know, you'd still be, um, you could still live along your individual, you know, wishes. Those wishes could be, like, I think what, what she's criticizing in that quote is the institutionalization of all these things, right? The institutionalization is where the oppression begins. Mm -hmm. and, and as long as these things are individual, I think she's kind of, 
to me, that's what it appears. You know, as long as these things are individual wishes, the way you put them, yeah. uh, they, they're okay. But at the moment you institutionalize them, that is where their tyranny begins. So it's basically, I think, anarchism. Is I would, I don't know a lot about it, but from what I know, the Wikipedia page, maybe, um, it's just that you know, it's anti-institution, mm-hmm. essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything that you could think of as an institution mm-hmm. and and roughly i think institutions are any sets of rules mm-hmm. right and that is again bringing out that contradiction that you know if we have no institutions how do we organize ourselves right essentially institutions being a set of rules right yeah um as i understand anarchism is a diverse um um, there's many diverse um, directions in which you can take anarchism. There's many diverse ideas beca- behind anarchism. And um, from what I understand, from what this uh, group really is, it goes more in the direction of libertarian anarchism. Not in the sense, not in the American sense of the word, but uh, rather in the European sense, in the uh, French sense, uh, uh, pensée libertarienne. And um, what I can say to that is that um, this um, theory emphasizes that the main um, f- uh, enemy of, the, of uh, the people in general, all the people, is, uh, or the society as we can put it, is um, the government. So basically it is a war, it is a conflict between uh, the society and the government and uh, that by getting rid, by uh, liberating ourselves from the government, um, we can um, build a better society, but it ignores at the same time um, the contradictions within um, the different classes of society as uh, the most exploited are uh, by these means not really liberated from their oppression, um, but uh, rather only from the oppressive, uh, from a possibly oppressive state. And um, really there's still um, uh, it is still possible to oppress these people, uh, to oppress the most exploited people within the society uh, by the um, the people with um, with uh, a capital, let's say, at least. Um, uh, just to actually respond directly to that um, sort of traditional anarchism, maybe our sort of idea of anarchism comes from Kropotkin. And uh, in Kropotkin, it give, there, there are actually three sort of... Uh, forces of oppression. There's the, the state, there's <coughs> capital, and then there's religion. And we actually have to free ourselves uh, from that. And anarchists often, uh, you know, they, they realize the contradictions within anarchism. And what they do is they often also then take like another theory with them, such as uh, communism. So it's anarcho-communism. Cool, yeah, uh, good. So uh, really quick, I want to address what you said about institutions. And uh, I think that, um, uh, so at the community level, uh, it, within an anarchist society, it's 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 accepted to uh, to sort of create your own in, endogenous institutions. I guess is the word I used. And um, in, in other words, if a group, if a, if a, if, a, if an anarchist community just decides that they have uh, a certain idea of, like, I don't know, even something like a book sharing thing, where everybody you know brings books or something, you could even name this an institution. But the point is that institutions per se are not necessarily okay. evil. That the anarchists perhaps are more concerned with uh, arbitrary power and structures of of domination. Uh, yeah, and then um, I'm, I'm just going to continue here. So good. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, so the, in, in classical anarchist theory, you might say that uh, uh, there's this kind of negative political view, yeah, uh, where it's freedom from these sort of negative things. However, recently, uh, according to my uh, internet research, there's been sort of a, a shift towards uh, a, a positive political vi- vision in anarchy. Yeah, and I have a quote here again from this pan uh, this pan network. So uh, we need to offer and I quote, we need to offer uh, a political vision that encompasses legislation, implementation, adjudication, and enforcement, and that shows how each would be effectively accomplished in a non-authoritarian way. Promoting positive outcomes would not only provide our contemporary activism with much needed long-term hope, it would also inform our immediate responses to today's electoral, lawmaking, law enforcement, and court system, and thus many of our strategic choices. So uh, it seems uh, that there's kind of this movement in anarchist theory at the moment towards a more positive political vision. Yeah, uh, good. I have uh, one more quote that I would like to read on that topic. 
And uh, uh, yeah, so uh, their uh, image of anarchism is not true. They're, in this case, being uh, people with a negative political vision of anarchism. It's not true, according to this quote. This is uh, um, Daniel Gurin. Yeah? Uh, he says, constructive anarchism, which found its most accomplished expressions in the writings of Bakunin, relies on organization, on self-discipline, on integration, on a centralization which is not coercive but federalist. It relates to large-scale industry, to modern technology, to the modern proletariat, to genuine internationalism. Uh, in the modern world, the material, intellectual, and moral interests have created between all parts of a nation and even different nations a real and solid unity, and this unity will survive all states. So that's from his book, uh, Le Anarchisme. Uh, my French is not great. Good. Um, yes. So coming back uh, to the questions of crime, and you know, I don't actually have a solution. I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't come up with a positive political vision of anarchy as it relates to crime and punishment. Uh, uh, I think that that's really a task for you know some heavy duty theory, and I also think that that's something that I would love to do here uh, on our podcast sometime. But today, uh, I wanted to leave it a little bit open ended. However. Um, Perhaps uh, to give a little bit of uh, direction to this open-endedness, uh, you might start to think of a response to crime or a response to punishment as a kind of self-organized -organ rehabilitation and restoration that's embedded in a wider system of confederated anarchist networks. Yeah. So uh, the difficulty is, of course, you know, again. Uh, creating a political vision that most, if not all, anarchist communities can accept. Yeah? And how to accomplish that is also, is, is of course a very difficult question. I, some ideas I had were maybe through indoctrination or shaming and boycotting, all, uh, all good words. Uh, but uh, but yeah, the idea is is that the the, the, the rehabilitation and the uh, and the restoration uh, uh, with regards to um, crime and punishment uh, should uh, be not only self organized so that interested parties go and create the possibility for restoration to take place, but it also should be embedded in this uh, network of sort of positive anarchist political vision, yeah, so that there's some kind of oversight over the mechanisms that we use to police and to punish. And uh, that was uh, more or less yeah, where I, I was going. I just wanted yeah. to say something to that. That was, that was um, I think maybe the way that you were saying that, you know, there's been a change in anarchist thought. Maybe there's, there's anarchist thinkers that, you know, have a different conception of the human subject altogether. Mm -hmm. So this sort of a problematique that of the, you know, to use... Um, an enlightenment terminology of corruption of the will, you know, crimes are a result of the corruption of the will. Mm. Now, if you don't have a corruption, corrupt will, you don't have these crimes, mm. right? So if anarchists presume, presuppose or presume a subject that is not problematic in the consciousness and there is no corruption of the will, there's probably not going to be these crimes. So I think that could be um, one, of the, one of the positive ways of getting out of this enigma, I don't know, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I think you're really right, and uh, to a certain extent, uh, I mean, that's sort of what these principles were in the beginning. I mean, we need to sort of have principles in our culture and society that we we feel driven to to holding to, not because some in coercive institution, uh, you know, tells us to do that, but because we actually feel, you know, that's something that we deem as valuable for our society. And these principles then can for the most, you know, as, as we said, prevent crime, you know, because, you know, if we hold the principles to it, uh, then, or to these principles, then crimes won't be committed. But of course, there will always be, I mean, we have uh, individual uh, variation in the world. Uh, there will always be people who probably break law some way or another, or who, I don't know, are psychopathic some way or another. I don't know. I don't want to, like, uh, uh, speak against, you know, people with mental abilities, because in the, in the last uh, few weeks, we've been hearing a lot of about how like gun control um, should have background checks to make sure people don't have met, uh, with mental uh, disability don't get guns. But I, th I think that's also a bad argument, because not everyone with mental disabilities is, is a bad person or is even unhinged or anything that's, you know, it stigmatizes them. But nonetheless, there are going to be uh, you know, people who, who don't follow the rules and, and we need some ways to punish them. 
in terms of uh, well, what concerns uh, punishment and all that, um, I would like to say that from uh, what I believe in and what I understand is that in uh, our present society, for example, crimes such as um, rapism or um, other such uh, personal crimes actually uh, stem for, from the education of the society, from the education system, from what we see in the pictures and the media every day, from the movies that we watch, from the books that we read, um, and uh, the general culture uh, with which we grow up. And to change that, it's not enough just to create a small um, um, a com commune, which is uh, somehow um, um, separated from the rest of society, but to change the society itself through um, a different education, uh, to uh, ban, uh, what, to try to um, change the culture, to change uh, what we watch, um, uh, what we read, what we see, the advertisements that we see. And um, yeah. Cool, and I would just like to end uh, wrapping it up with uh, with one more quote, uh, which I which which I think goes exactly in this direction. So, uh, uh, quote: A balance must be achieved between the suffocating tyranny of unbridled authority and the kind of autonomy that leads to petty local patriotism, separation of little grouplets, and the fragmentation of society. Libertarian organization must reflect the complexity of social relationships and promote promote solidarity on the widest possible scale. It can be defined as federalism, coordination through free agreement, locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. It consists of a vast coordinated network of voluntary alliances embracing the totality of social life in which all groups and associations reap the benefits of unity while still exercising autonomy within their own spheres and expanding the range of their freedom. So this is the uh, sort of the federalist idea coming into it. And that was from the anarchistlibrary.org. Uh, uh, Sam Sam Dogloff, Dogloff, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, what what um, to what um, was said earlier about um, about the way that we're educating. I think that uh, that's that's a very good point. This whole notion of of you know patriarchy that we've had, you know, again restricting just to the example of rape, you know, the way historically women have, has been presented, you know, that that has a big role to do with with the perpetration of rape altogether. You know, the whole, the notion of honor and, you know, the whole notion of, you know, de-honoring somebody and human being, you know, that is, I think, where the problem lies. And, and I totally agree, you know, um, here that that is something that needs to be addressed. That, you know, that the way we look at women, the way we, you know, conceive ourselves and others fundamentally need to be rethought re if we are to, you know, to be able to, achieve a totally emancipatory um, or a decently emancipatory um, existence at all. Yeah. yeah. And um, that was that was um, on anarchism. Yeah, on anarchism. All right. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, thanks yeah, a yeah. Lot. Thank, you, Joe. thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Don't forget to uh, watch our podcast or listen to it on YouTube. Uh, yeah, like us. That. Don't forget, don't forget do that. that at all. You know, like it and every day, you know, if you're listening to this right now, you've yeah. probably remembered, but yeah. uh, share us. Uh, like we've got comment. a website, comment. mainstreamidea.com, uh, Facebook, moral economy, share, you know, even message us, you know, talk to us. We, yeah. we want to Call start, us on our phones. we yeah. want to start podcasts like this, you know, in other places, not just us, you know, mm. interact with us. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Stay critical. And be critical. Yeah. Stay critical. Stay critical, guys. Stay critical.
nowhere to run.